and an azide and you use copper to facilitate that reaction. And what that does is it takes those two specific types of molecules and brings them together to make what we call a triazole. And that's just a five-membered ring of atoms that has three nitrogens and two carbons in that ring. And it is a powerful system that is found across all of science. People have used that particular system in agriculture, in drug development, in material sciences, and Caroline Bertozzi won the Nobel Prize in 2022, along with Sharpless and Meldell, for using this reaction to study what's happening in a cell. And so this chemistry is really, really clever. But for my lab, we actually use it a little bit differently. What we do is we actually manipulate the product of the click reaction to making other ring systems that also have nitrogen atoms in them. And some of these ring systems are also found in a lot of pharmaceutical drugs that actually are overrepresented with these nitrogen ring systems that we try to make. So basically the goal is to, to use this chemistry to aid in the you know, pharmaceutical industry's efforts to make in affordable drugs. Andre, before I say goodbye, can I just get back to your TikToks and ask oh, it? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> are you choreographing a dance routine currently? Oh my God. So there are quite a few dance routines that are being choreographed. And of course, um, some tracks on a new Beyonce album that, you know, we think we could find some chemistry connections to that we're, we're, we're working on. So yeah, we, we have our hands full. Uh, Andre Isaacs, thank you so much for sharing with us. And, you know, people come for the Beyonce and they stay for the chemistry. Thank you. <laughs> We always leave space for your letters and texts. And in last week's show, Colin got in touch with a question about why our hair grows the way it does. And it triggered more questions about the variety of hair types out there, which got me thinking about an addition to the World Service program Crowd Science that I presented all about hair. I spoke to the wonderful Dr. Tini Lassisi at Penn State University, who told me that tightly curled hair could have been an important adaptation for human evolution. Tina did experiments to see if human hair really does help protect our brains from overheating. To do this, she needed help from Loughborough University in the UK. They used this really creepy android called a thermal mannequin, and you basically can put clothes on it, or if you're me, you put a wig on it, and you basically measure how that is affecting its ability to lose and gain heat. So Tina added an afro and straight hair wigs to these cyborgs and measured how much solar radiation was getting down to the mannequin's scalp. And she found a huge difference. Let me tell you, I was shocked. What we found is that if you have tightly curled hair, that hair is able to protect you and that radiation doesn't travel all the way down to your scalp. And then you have straight hair, which puts you at a better spot than having no hair at all because it offers some protection. But at the same time, because straight hair fibers are all lined up, you know, so neatly packed next to each other, it also ends up insulating your head. So you can't lose heat as efficiently as you can if you had this curly structure that has all of these air pockets. It's constantly amazing to me that evolution has come up with all these neat adaptations. The difference between how straight hair actually retains heat, so it's perfect for winter, and the curlier hair allows for cooling, which is perfect for tropical levels. That was really mind-blowing. I can be prouder now more than ever, and there's a reason why I have evolved in this way. Still to come, how an eclipse helped out Einstein's theory after this. Welcome back to the Unexpected Elements Quiz. Earlier on in the show, I asked about the hottest chili pepper on the Scoville scale, a scale developed to measure capsaicin, the chemical in chili peppers that produces a heat-like sensation. I asked, was it A, pepper X, B, the Carolina Reaper, or C, the Trinidad Scorpion? All three are peppers hot enough to make you cry, but well... A, pepper X. 
It was recently bred by Ed Curry to steal his own title from the Carolina Reaper peppers he also breeds, which used to top the Scoville scale with 2.2 million heat units. For comparison, that's 800 times hotter than a jalapeno. Pepper X averages 2.6 million Scoville heat units, and if anyone has tried one, please email unexpected at bbc.co.uk and let us know how it went. In amongst the emails and texts from you, sometimes there's a question to challenge the detective powers of the Unexpected Elements team. Cue music. Yes, it's time for Ask the Unexpected, and this week we've had a question from Gerald. Hello, my name is Gerald Bundiga, a creative artist from West Nile. That is a region in northwestern Uganda. I'm a big fan of Unexpected Elements, thanks to Manny, who is doing a fabulous job over there. Well, I have this question that keeps popping up into my mind. Is the earth shrinking? Think about humans digging and mining to build skyscrapers, dams, and other mega construction projects. Thank you, Gerald. That's a really interesting question. So, if we're taking stuff out of the earth, is the earth shrinking? Well, we've done exactly what you would expect and found someone who knows the answer. Here's David Rothery, Professor of Planetary Geosciences at the Open University. This is an interesting question. Uh, when raw materials are mined or quarried, we take stuff from the earth's crust and pile it up on top. But in the long term, it all ends up as ruins or gets tipped into landfill sites. So I don't regard this as the earth shrinking. But there is a way in which the Earth is shrinking. It's hot inside and is gradually cooling down as the radioactive heat supply decreases. Now when solids cool down, they contract in size. It's called thermal contraction. So this very long-term cooling must result in the Earth shrinking a bit. We can see the effect of the planet shrinking through thermal contraction when we look at Mercury. That's the planet that I study. There are kilometre-high escarpments running across its surface called lobate scarps, which are where thrust faults reach the surface. You can think of them as like the wrinkles that form on, say, an apple when it dries out. The displacement across each thrust fault is typically two or three kilometres, and by mapping them out, we can work out that the whole planet has contracted in radius by about seven kilometres in the past three billion years. Now, the Earth is probably cooling down a bit more slowly than Mercury because it's a bigger planet, but we'd still expect maybe about a kilometre of global contraction in the past billion years. The trouble is we can't see this on the Earth's surface because unlike Mercury, we have plate tectonics here. Plates are shifting around at speeds of centimetres a year, and new materials added at mid-ocean ridges and destroyed at major thrust or subduction zones where continents have pushed over oceans. As a result, active thrust faults on Earth take only about a million years to move by an amount that would take a billion years for a thrust fault on Mercury. Any signal of global contraction in the Earth's crust is completely swamped by the faster and greater movements caused by plate tectonics. There is a further line of thought that Gerald's question provoked to me, which is that material is being added to the solid Earth all the time. This comes in the form of meteorite debris arriving from space. Most of it's in the form of dust-sized micrometeorites rather than as big lumps. Most people don't notice this, but about 150 million kilograms is added to the Earth every year. Sounds like an awful lot, but if we spread it out over the 500 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface, that's well less than a kilogram per square kilometer per year. And by my calculations, it would take about a billion years to bury the ground in a 10 centimetre layer of meteorite dust. So for summer, I say that the Earth is very, very slowly shrinking, becoming dense as it does, and the rate of addition of new material from space is nowhere near enough to compensate for this in terms of maintaining its size. Thanks to David Rothery and to Gerald for the question.
And if you have a question for the team, remember you can contact the show on unexpected at bbc.co.uk or WhatsApp us on plus four four three three zero six seven eight thirty eighty. Or you can write to us, Unexpected Elements, BBC World Service, Cardiff CF ten four G. Christina, I just want to ask, did did anyone clap where you were? Nobody was clapping, but everyone had their arms up towards the sky during the eclipse. I guess it's a different way of acknowledging it. <laughs> but all of the eclipse um, hoo-ha um, made me think back to the news headline from the New York Times in 1919, so a hundred and something years ago, 105 years ago, which ran lights